So quick background before we get into Cola itself. Um, if you have any experience with OpenStack, uh, this is probably not new information to you. OpenStack is not easy to deploy, and if you think it's not easy to deploy, it's even harder to manage. And until recently, if you are an OpenStack operator, you want to build your OpenStack cloud, you don't have a whole lot of options. You have an option to go ahead and deploy OpenStack on bare metal. You have an option to go and deploy OpenStack as virtual machines. Hello, very similar to the options you have to deploy an application, right? Because that's what essentially OpenStack is. And so we, you know, we thought to ourselves is, hmm, if OpenStack is an application and all these great things are happening around containers and, and, um, and making application development more efficient, well, why can't we apply those same benefits to OpenStack? And until recently, containers weren't very popular. And a certain company that maybe you, you uh, may have heard about, Docker, has uh, really caused containers to get very popular uh, in the last year, year and a half or so. And then one other aspect too is, there's really no de tool that has become the de facto standard within the OpenStack community for deploying and operating OpenStack. Um, I've been working uh, with OpenStack since the Diablo release, which I think is about three and a half years or so. And um, some of my early work was around the automation and deployment of OpenStack. And I spent a lot of time uh, teamed up with Puppet Labs and developed uh, the early uh, Puppet modules for OpenStack. And um, got to a point where I realized, gosh, this still is not the best way of doing things. And I experienced that firsthand. So now let's get into, well, you know, what is Cola? Well, no, that's not Cola. That's a koala. So uh, Cola is an open source project that's hosted on StackForge. If, um, if you are unfamiliar with StackForge, it's uh, a repository on GitHub. So you go to github.com slash StackForge, and you're going to see all these different projects that are associated to OpenStack. Somehow, some way, this project it doesn't fall directly in the OpenStack namespace, but um, it's, a, it's a place for kind of incubation projects um, that don't have to follow the same development um, review process and so forth. Um, allows these kind of incubation projects to move very quickly um, and is just kind of that central hub for, for these projects. And that's where uh, Cola lives today. It is um, licensed under Apache and uh, fresh off the digital press as of six hours ago, we have got a mission statement for Cola. The project started, uh, I want to say about eight months ago, shortly before uh, the Paris Design Summit. And uh, what Cola does is it provides production-ready containers and deployment tools for operating OpenStack clouds that are scalable, reliable, fast, and are upgradable using community best practices. Well, okay, now we have a little understanding what Cola is. Who's behind it? Who is Cola, right? Cola is not Cisco. As you can see on the pie charts, it's probably a little difficult to, to see here, but um, we've got a lot of diversity on this project. And I, you know, I can't understate that enough on how important it is to have diversity in an open source project. There's not a single company that controls this project. If Cisco, for some reason, was to pull out of the project, Cola is going to move along and continue its, its development. And you see myself, a lot of other people that are um, real active contributors on this project. So just you know, something to really keep in mind if, if you're wanting to adopt more and more open source software, take the time and really kind of pull the layers back and see, okay, who's behind this? Is it controlled by a single 
affiliation? Does it have good diversity? Good diversity is, is what you want in an open source project. So how does Cola help, right? What benefits does it bring to the table? Number one, deploy. Cola is able to deploy your OpenStack services, but it's not just a deployment tool, but it also is about how do I operate this new OpenStack cloud that has been containerized using Cola, right? So we're trying to solve two of those big pain points that I shared with you in that background slide, right? Because it's difficult to deploy OpenStack, but it's even more difficult to operate it. How else does Cola help us? Is that um, in a DevOps type of environment, what Cola brings to the table through container technology are some features such as images. So images allow me to go ahead and take my application runtime and package it up in a real convenient fashion, makes that application runtime very reliable, repeatable. All these things are really good things for a DevOps environment. And what's nice about images, specifically for, for Docker containers, and, and Docker is the container engine that's, that's used by Cola, is that there's a registry component. So these images aren't just sitting on your laptop, they're not sitting in some server, there's actually a registry. They, uh, the registry can be a public registry like Docker Hub, it could be your private registry. That component allows me to very easily create an image, push it to the registry, pull it down so I can create it, have it sit on my laptop, push it up to the registry, pull it down to my test dev environment, um, have it be pulled in by my CI CD pipeline for testing, and then bring it into a production environment. So that, when you hear about Docker and containers and that portability, this is a big piece of it, okay? And then versioning. And part of this I'm gonna show in the demonstration. With the versioning, I could go ahead and have um, an image, run a container from that image. Okay, great, I wanna make a change, make a change to it, create a new version of that image, and then I could go ahead and test that newer version. If it doesn't work very well, very easily revert back to my previous working image. And then it's a, just a very application-centric environment. Um, you know, when you look at containers, specifically Docker containers, it's geared towards an application developer. And to reiterate this point of the images is the repeatability, right? So instead of using a declarative model, which tools like Puppet use, right? So I go ahead and say, here's, here's the model of the system that I want to deploy. I go ahead and run Puppet. It goes ahead and makes all the changes to the system and it may run 100 different steps, make changes to services, configuration files, and so forth. But it's, because of those 100 steps, it's very fragile. Whereas when I go ahead and I create my image, it's immutable, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't change. I create it, it's the same way that it was on my laptop as it is in, in test dev, as it is in production. And so that's a really, uh, that's important when you want that predictability, that reliability is a uh, mutable properties of containers. And then um, this picture you know, is just representing the reliability aspect again, right? Man's best friend, reliable, you can expect uh, you know, your dog always to be there by your side. And I kind of think of the same thing um, is that there's no questioning whether this OpenStack service that's been containerized by Cola, that it worked when I ran it in my test dev environment, and oh gosh, now that there's a different IP address or there's some difference in the production environment, it breaks. It's not the case. It's going to be the same in any of those environments. 
and it's fast. So when we talk about that performance penalty that you get uh, running services and virtual machines, and that's why most OpenStack deployments are run on bare metal, is because you don't want to pay that performance tax. Right? So containers, real um, strong aspect of containers is that there's little to no performance penalty to run your services in containers. This is a quick view of the Cola architecture, and really the Cola architecture are those green components, and the blue components are the architecture components that work with Cola. So when you look at in the upper right-hand corner, DevOps engineering, they're plugging away, making improvements to the code, pushing those to a review system where changes are being approved, um, integration testing is being performed, uh, then um, continuous deployment to make sure that um, the tests do actually work in a reference deployed in, uh, type of environment. And at the end of that CI CD process, it should kick off a deployment as well as the output being the image of that service. So if I make a change to uh, Nova Compute, run it through CI CD, test pass, the output should be a new Nova Compute image, as well as we tell Ansible to go and kick off a deploy. And when it's kicking off the deploy, it's talking to Compose on the, the, on the host and saying, Compose, update this image tag. Remember, going back to the versioning aspect of containers, update this image tag to the latest tag or whatever I call that tag for that particular image, and then deploy the new container from, from that image. And then the lower portion, of course, we're running Docker on the host, some type of operating system, um, and the operating system leveraging uh, the same kernel facilities that, that the container runtimes leverage, if it's Docker, Rocket, you name it. It's things like namespaces, C groups, to provide that isolation environment for uh, the particular service. So here's some pros. Uh, again, I covered a lot of these, but just a quick snapshot. Uh, the immutable properties. So what is immutable again? When I go ahead and create some, something, the something in this uh, instance being an OpenStack service, in the container, it's, a, it's an immutable property, so it does not change, right? As opposed to having some type of um, system, a declarative system that I deploy and then I start making a bunch of changes to. Well, you start making those changes, there's a possibility something doesn't change the way you want it to. So it's like frozen in time, okay? Uh, it's portable, a big part of that is the images and the registry. So I go ahead and, and create that image. It's that, immutable, uh, it's that immutable property that goes ahead and we can push it, pull it, push it, pull it um, from the registry up and down. So if you're familiar with Git, I kind of say this is more like Git than tar, right? We go ahead and create a tar ball and it's sitting here. It's like, okay, what do I do with it? I SSH it around. Or with Git, I have the project locally, make the changes. I could see what changes, commit those changes, and I could push them up to my GitHub repo, pull them down from my repo to another environment, push them back up, so on and so forth. So that's a big aspect of the portability. The other aspect is that we're talking about much smaller image sizes than virtual machines. And then you know, around Docker, the, the, the uh, container runtime that we've chosen for the project, massive community, massive development that's going on. That was a big piece of why we decided on Docker as opposed to some other container runtime like LXC or something like that. Well, the cons, the technology is green. Lots of changes going on. Um, so that's part of what you have to accept 
going down this road. The good thing is because of the amount of development that is happening, it's maturing at a much rapid uh, pace than a lot of open source projects. Uh, and Cola itself is even greener. Like I said, it's uh, maybe only about eight months old. There are some additional complexities um, that when you first experience it, it may be a bit of a learning curve for you, but you get through that learning curve uh, fairly quickly, and that learning curve is worth the investment for the value that you get by running your OpenStack services and containers. And then the difficult to audit, uh, when you try to audit within containers, there's the additional steps that you have to take to understand what is really going on for troubleshooting purposes. Um, and so there's just some additional complexity there that you wouldn't normally get uh, in a non-containerized environment. So show me, I've got a quick demonstration that I'd like to share with you. All right, so this is a demonstration that I created two weeks ago for uh, the Liberty De uh, Design Summit. Oh, let me rewind it really quick. And so what I'm gonna show you here is deploying OpenStack, uh, the Kilo release in Docker containers using Cola. It's on a single node. Um, and part of Cola is that we've got tooling around the containers to make it easy for you to use the containers. Um, some of those tools are bash scripts. Some of the tools are things like heat templates if you want to deploy using heat. And then the last piece of the demonstration is actually showing you uh, the operational aspect. Like I said, not just deploying OpenStack in containers, but how do I then operate it? And one of the big operational challenges is how do I upgrade OpenStack? Well, within an OpenStack containerized environment, we're no longer trying to treat OpenStack as one big software component, but as a bunch of microservices that we manage. And so I'm gonna go ahead and, and upgrade one of those containers uh, to simulate how you would upgrade uh, in a real environment. So what I showed you there is I downloaded the project and I got into the project directory and um, there are some tools here. One of them is uh, a tool that generates a bunch of environmental, uh, a bunch of environment variables. You know, I said that, uh, that the containers are immutable and so when we create that image and we go to run that Docker image and be, instantiate a container, we configure certain properties of that container at runtime. And we do that by passing in these environment variables into the container during runtime. And so this is the GenEnv tool that generates an environments file. And again, whenever I start up a container, as part of starting up the container, I say, Docker, use this image and then use this file to feed in all of those key value pairs to configure the service at runtime. And um, when I run the GenM tool, the output is this um, openstack.env file. And again, that's all of our key value pairs uh, that are used as a configuration element of the containers. Some of these key value pairs um, are used across all of the containers. A good example is, well, what's the database IP address? Instead of having a key value pair for each and every service, let's have one that all of the containers use. And then we have a simple tool. Um, again, it's a wrapper script around Docker Compose that starts up all of the containers or stops all of the containers um, and again, most of these tools that I'm showing you is really for like a developer. 
because cola is still very new, uh, you know, a big focus is around how do we make that developer experience the best possible to attract more developers and get more developers working on the project. And what you're seeing here is I run the, the, the start tool, it fires up a bunch of containers. All the containers start up, it gives me some kind of output. I don't know why this quality is uh, not nearly as good as what it used to be, but I'll just try to talk you through it, so bear with me here. And what you saw was that the containers started. But what you'll notice now is, okay, the containers started, what does that mean? The services that make up my OpenStack cloud started. You see that there's some level of configuration um, that we've applied, things like uh, keystone endpoint information, which is necessary so that the services can talk to one another. But most everything else is not configured. Uh, there's no uh, glance images, there's no Nova key pairs. So it's a kind of a blank slate uh, environment. Another tool here that's next is uh, this init run once tool that we use to then configure the environment, uh, do things like set up our neutron networks, neutron subnets, neutron router, our security groups. We alter uh, Nova quotas because uh, in the next step of the demonstration, we're gonna actually deploy several Nova instances that would normally um, be outside of our, our typical quota. And you see that I run uh, this script and it goes ahead and does all the hard work for us. Last piece of the configuration is I'm now going to use a heat template to say, hey, let's go ahead and actually start spawning instances and let's see if this stuff truly works. And uh, there's really three, uh, three tools here. There's a launch script um, and then two uh, heat templates. And I'll go into uh, each of these here. Launch script basically says, hey, let's uh, grab some uh, environment variables for our neutron network subnet information, and then simply let's create a heat stack. The first heat uh, template is, is um, a resource group. So this is a special type of heat resource. And what it actually does, is it calls a different heat template that defines all the specific resources, such as Nova instances, neutron network or subnet information. Um, and then it defines the number of instances that you want to uh, instantiate. In our case, it's uh, the count is 15. And here is the heat template that that resource group is actually calling. And you see here, um, this template defines uh, the Nova server, the Neutron port to create, the floating IP to assign to that Nova server. And then I launch, uh, launch the, uh, the script, again, to do all the, all the hard work for me. You see that the heat stack is in progress. It's gonna take a little while since we're uh, spawning a lot of different uh, virtual machines and doing a lot of different work underneath the hood. But you see things are actually starting to happen now, right? Here's a bunch of Neutron ports. I do a Nova list. I see a bunch of uh, Nova servers that are starting to be spawned. And one thing to point out here is we, we ran into a, a bug with Nova so that when you do a Nova list, you'll see that um, the, the Nova servers are being spawned. They turn into an active state, but a lot of them don't even have an IP. Well, they really do have an IP, but um, it's just not being shown by the Nova list output. And so to work around that, I'm gonna take a few steps to find out what is the IP of that server. And one of the methods that I can use is just looking at the, the console log of the VM and getting the IP there. And then I could use that IP and look at uh, the Neutron port and it will tell me the floating IP. So you see here, um, we actually have an IP, it's 10.0.0.5 for the instance. And I'm gonna use that IP to do a Neutron port list, 
grab that IP and then find out what the floating IP is because that's the IP I'm gonna to use to test connectivity to the virtual machine. You see that, um, that I'm able to ping the virtual machine's IP, floating IP, and I could also SSH into it. And the next thing I show you here is look, all 15 Nova servers um, are now in an active state. And from my particular Nova server, I can actually even ping out to Google. So I'm feeling really comfortable now that things are working the way they're supposed to. I could get into an instance, I could go ahead and from the instance, ping out to Google. So here's the, the, the last piece of the demo. Great, now it's deployed and it's deployed successfully. I've kicked the tires and feel comfortable that things are working the way they're supposed to. Um, but now what about the operational aspect? What if I want to upgrade one of those microservices? And I mentioned that uh, we're following best practices. So uh, within Docker best practices is that each and every container is a single process, right? And if you look here, uh, Nova Compute is actually three different containers, one for the Nova Compute uh, service, one for libvirt, and then we actually even have a Nova compute data service that stores the data for Nova compute. So we separate the data from the application and um, it provides some additional portability uh, for us. Um, and now I'm gonna go ahead and go into the Nova libvirt directory and I am going to simulate an upgrade. So what I do is I go into the start script for that particular service, and I would make some kind of modification. In, you know, in this example, I'm just gonna go ahead and say, you know, this is an upgrade, and I, and I do it 100 times so that it's easy for us to look at the, the logs and, and experience this. And then I'm gonna go ahead and build a new image from this change, right? So now I've got a new image of this service. I build it. Docker finishes building uh, the new image and then says, hey, Daniel, go and do whatever you want with it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to tell Docker Compose to up the set of containers. And so by doing that, you'll see that it's recreating Nova uh, Compute Data, Nova Compute, and the, uh, the libvirt container that I went ahead and did that upgrade to. And now I wanna take a look at the logs and I see that I'm now running my new image of libvirt. Okay, great, it's been upgraded. Did the environment break? No, I can still actually go in and SSH. Maybe I missed that really quick here. Uh, And so I, I go ahead and do the upgrade and I could tell that I could still SSH into my image. Things are still working. And uh, you know, just a quick example of how you can do an upgrade to one of your microservices um, in your containerized OpenStack environment. So uh, I know it's probably a lot to digest. Uh, take a look at Docker documentation. Again, the project is hosted on StackForge. Um, so, Last but not least, let's uh, just quickly cover the roadmap. So where's the project going? We wanna be able to implement all the services. Right now we're implementing most of the OpenStack services like Nova, uh, all your Nova services, Nova API Scheduler, Conductor, Compute. Um, I believe Cinder was just added, uh, the Cinder volume uh, was just added last week. Uh, Multi-host deployment. In the demo I showed you Everything was on a single host. OpenStack operators obviously want to be able to deploy across a large set of hosts. And so uh, there's a big focus around the multi-host deployment, which goes back to our Ansible playbooks. Our current Ansible playbook is really around a, like a development environment on a single host. Uh, but we want to be able to expand those playbooks, deploy it across a vast set of hosts, and that brings us to high availability so that we not only deploy this microservice containerized OpenStack environment, 
um, across tons of hosts, but that there's no single point of failure, that it scales well, that it's reliable, all the things that are important to OpenStack operators. And then install from source, we currently install from um, RDO packages, we want to be able to provide some options on, um, uh, on the code. And so in summary, <laughs> walk away with OpenStack inside containers equals COLA. And we really uh, need your help. We'd love, for, uh, we'd love for you to get involved in the project. Uh, it could be something as simple as helping with documentation. So if you don't know Python or Bash scripting or even you know, Docker containers very well, we can use the help. The, the community is just growing exponentially. Going into the Vancouver Des Design Summit, I want to say uh, going into that, we had doubled probably uh, in size going up into Vancouver, or yeah, into Vancouver. And then coming out of Vancouver, we probably close to doubled again. There's, uh, there's a lot of interest in the project, and uh, we'd love for you to get involved. So, thank you for your time. <laughs>